and hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to another episode of the Kewl Show. I am your host today, the insider of the insiders, Tyler Kewl, and we have us another great show here today guys because guess what? I'm not alone again. I'm still in Texas as you see because this is clearly not my home because I don't have artwork like that over there and whatnot. But before we get to all that, we must thank our sponsors here on 12 Ounce Sports. That's where it is in the corner. 12 Ounce Sports. Make sure you check them out because you're watching this obviously on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, or Zingo TV channel 761. Also our amazing sponsors, mybookie.ag down there in the corner. Make sure you check them out and all of their awesome stuff that they have because they are pretty uh, pretty cool with what they got. They got, obviously, you can bet on sports. You go on there, 12-ounce sports, sign up for free using the promo code, and bet on baseball, basketball, hockey. I don't think you can bet on curling, but the Women's World's Curlings are going on right now, but there's all that. Go on mybookie.ag, and as always, Second String Leather Company up there in the corner. Get in there. Make sure you check it out there. Hashtag Second String Leather. Hashtag Crafted from the Crease. SecondStringLeather.com. All the great products we have. The reason why I'm running so fast is because we have us another guest today because why would I ever want to be alone when I'm doing this show? That's just kind of a terrifying thing to do. Last thing you need, folks, is me talking to myself for an hour. I do that enough as it is off air. But we're being joined today for now a third time here on TKS, one of the co-hosts of the O Show covering all the greatest ups and downs of the Ontario Hockey League. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the show. Tate Harris, Tate, how are we doing today? Good, Tyler. Yeah, you you sped through that intro that was that was quick um and, and uh, i'm thankful you did it for me i appreciate it but you, you could have taken your time i you know listen i have done intros where i've had people sit for five or six minutes the the most famous one was my brother took a while we had ken Weebon from winnipeg uh from sportsnet and boy that i remember i was looking over at him like hurry up but he's like he's just going through it pacefully and we have like we only have like 10 minutes with Ken Weave and he's sitting there just like doing this long intro and I'm like, get to the point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you listen to uh, overdrive uh, on TSN 1050 at all. It's a, a uh, the afternoon show on uh, Toronto sports radio. Oh yeah. With, uh, have, with noodles and O dog and them. Yeah. Yeah. And Brian Hayes and, and they always have Ray Ferraro on at five o'clock. And one time the Brian Hayes, the, the main host said, I, I know we have Ferraro on the line, but they kept the conversation. It had to be five fifteen by the time they actually <laughs> like had him talking. So it happens. It happens to the best of us. So well, I always hear it like they have like because I mean, I listen to other shows. I listen to Overdrive. I listen to Hockey Central at noon, and you just hear them like we got them waiting on the line right now. But we got to quickly get through this here. And I'm like, can you imagine sitting on? Because I, I know what it's like sitting on a line when you're on a phone call. You hear what's going on. And you just hear them talking, yammering away or whatever, and it's like. Like the Jeopardy theme's playing in your head. I'm like, all right, get to me, get to me, get to me. And eventually it does. But boy, you just sit there and you're like, was I going to have to like go to the bathroom or something here? <laughs> that would have been horrible. Well, the, the worst is if the op doesn't send you the feed. So you're just sitting there in silence. Oh, now that I thankfully with the, the shows I've appeared on, I have not had that problem. But that would be annoying because all of a sudden, because it makes this different sound too when they pull you on the air. And so yeah. like you can tell the difference. So imagine sitting there in silence. And we're live here with them. Like, jeez. Yeah, opening up with a question. You're like, yeah, yeah, boys. Uh, yeah, it's great to be on. A... <laughs> great to be on this so. show that, I'll be honest, I've been on hold so long I forgot where I'm at. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's no. always fun. Tate is outside. It's still in Kingsville, right? Yeah, still still in Kingsville. Got my own. I don't know. I think last time I was talking to you, I was looking for a house, but now I've bought a house. And my windows are open. I think it's like 72 degrees here today. Uh, so you might hear some lawnmowers going, but I think we'll be good. But yeah, still out in Kingsville. It's about a hundred percent humidity up here or down here in <laughs> Dallas. Well, it, it was weird because I get here last Sunday, do the show, or actually I came and played golf, and it was about seventy-five degrees, sunny, wasn't too bad though. I had a nice breeze, and then all of a sudden the clouds came, and it was like sixty-eight, sixty-nine for a couple days, which was actually comfortable for me because I'm go, of course, I'm going to the rink in a suit every day, which is painful. Then yesterday, I go play golf in the morning. It's 67, a little bit drizzly. Actually, it was very nice and comfortable and cool. And I come inside, take a nap, go to do the games in the afternoon. And all of a sudden, it's 78 degrees, 85% humidity, muggy. And I'm like walking in my suit. I'm like, I'm really running into the rink. And I went down as close as I could to the ice to cool off. Because even up in the booth, 
it's kind of warm. So I'm like getting as close as I can because I was starting to sweat in my suit. It's <laughs> not good for the climate. Everyone's like, oh, it's because you're from the north. I'm like, no, heat is heat. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, in Michigan, it's just, it, it gets pretty humid up here like during the summer. So, yeah. like, it, you, you kind of know what's up. Obviously, we don't have it for as long, but but it does get hot. Yeah, so before we get to the under-18s and talk about the OHL players playing for Team Canada, let's talk about some of the big news that came up this past week. One, I think the maybe the best positive news from this past week is that the IIHF announced that the Women's Worlds that was supposed to be in early May, actually supposed to be starting this week or next week over in Nova Scotia, is rescheduled for August, and it's probably going to be in Alberta, possibly the Edmonton bubble we'll see again in I don't know what your take is on it. It's good to see that this tournament's going to come back and, you know, with all the controversy on why it was canceled, why wasn't there a plan B, it's kind of hard to just up and move a tournament, even if it's in the same country. Yeah, obviously it's it's tough to do. It is great to see the news. And, and to me, it kind of shows the power of the people. We've seen this in the NCAA women's tournament as well. When, when people, I, mean, I don't want to use the word complain, but, you know, they use their voice to, to let people know that there's a problem here, that this shouldn't happen, and and kind of force companies and organizations to do the right thing. So happy to see that it's happening. Wish that there was kind of a plan B, and I get that it was the Nova Scotia government and, and the things that play there, but I'm excited to see it happen, and it's good that something's being done. Yeah, that's I mean, it's a big tournament for, for me because I love covering women's hockey. We have the NCAA women's coverage, and then, we, of course, we have the NWHL coverage in spades and the PWHPS. So it's a big thing, good thing that's happening. The other couple bits of news, the I think, oh, I guess the other positive news, Ryan Miller announced that he was going to retire after the season, and he picks up the win. I was actually able to listen to the game on my way home last night, and the, the Ducks broadcasters, for them, that was their game seven of the Stanley Cup Finals because, like, let's get Ryan this win. He picks up a 6-2 win, and great gesture, though, Tate. By it. You saw the L.A. Kings, they all came over because maybe Ryan Miller doesn't have the greatest numbers in the history of goaltending, but in terms of American goaltending, he is probably the standard for, you know, representing the country, at least in the goaltending position. Yeah, you know, like, when you see Ryan Miller, you do think of Team USA. Uh, he, I, I always thought he was a great goalie. Obviously, like he's forty years old now. You can't expect him to put out ridiculous numbers. And Tyler, I think you were a goalie, right? Yeah. And you're American born, so I, I mean, you, you probably understand this the most. Like he, he was a role model for for a lot of people. So it, it was great to see the handshakes, and especially when they're rivals like that. Like, what a way to go out. So. The, the crazy thing about that, well, because everyone remembers Ryan Miller, most notably for 2010. And the first thing I always say to, like, that is that is true because, I'll be honest, going to that game, the gold medal game, I was nervous. Of course, I was one of the few people cheering for Canada in the United States. But I went to that game thinking, oh, dear Lord, we're gonna they're going to lose again. I'm like My dad's like, why? I'm like, well, listen, the, people forget. People talk about how great that 2010 team was. They lost the Americans in pool play before the knockout stages. And of course that was when Marty Berdura was trying to play baseball. It was a goaltender, but <laughs> I, but then Roberto Longo comes in and he steals the show him and Ryan Miller went save for save. And I, I mean, that was dare I say at Ryan Miller's peak. Cause obviously after that Buffalo started to go downhill, but that just showed why he was so good. My thing with Miller though, goes back even long before that. Cause I remember when he was playing at MSU in Michigan state, one of the great Miller, the Miller tradition, the Miller dynasty there in East Lansing, he was the only, he's only the second Hobie Baker award winner that was a goaltender. So I, I knew he was going to be great, but I didn't know how long it was going to take him to get to the NHL. So when I saw him in 2010, it's like, see, I've known this guy was going to be able to do this for years. It just, <laughs> he needed a good team in front of him. Yeah. And Buffalo was good uh, right. the 07, for a bit yeah. there. Like I remember, I, I think, did they have the record or something for like uh, the best start to a season? Like they were like 16, 0 in like three or something like that. I think that I was, think. yeah, 06, 07 year, yeah. Because it was the year they, they lost to Carolina in 06. They get the ugly slug sweaters, and then yeah, Ryan the Miller becomes <laughs> they become a Vesna, becomes a Vesna caliber goaltender. That team was so, like, it was terrifying whenever the Leafs had to play them or anyone had to play them because they were so good. And they had a Finneganov, Briere, Drury was still at the top of his game. And then it was still an old-school team, a Lindy Ruff team, where they still had guys like, Coletta and Peters on the on their fourth line and 
that's why I think I'm glad that the one game Ryan Miller didn't play was that game against Ottawa in the regular season because, as we learned, Miller's not much of a fighter, and he would probably got killed <laughs> by Ray Emery in that, that brawl back on my birthday, yeah. by the way. Wow. Well, yeah, you do think of him with uh, Lucic, too, that oh, yeah. uh, the big, I guess it's considered a hit, but uh, it, uh, that was pretty crazy, so... I, I look at that hit. I still look back at it because as much as I am a goaltender and a card carry member of the goaltenders union, I've always had this issue with if you're going to come out of the net that far, you may be fair game. Now, that's just because I didn't mind hitting people either, though. If I'm going to come that far, <laughs> I should be allowed to go brain. If a guy's coming down the wing and he's got his head down, if he gets that puck first, I would not mind hitting him or getting hit. I've been hit. I've been knocked down. If I'm that far out, though, I get it. It's kind of my fault that I'm out that far anyways, but... Yeah, and of course Ryan Miller doesn't like getting hit because then again he's about a buck seventy, I think he was at the yeah. time, and Milan Lucic is two hundred twenty. <laughs> Probably hurt a little bit. <laughs> yeah, maybe bigger than yeah. Well I played uh, lacrosse growing up, so goalies were allowed to come out, play almost as if they were players and get hit. Yeah. Um for some reason there's still like fights so if someone did try to hit the goalie and stuff, so even though it was allowed, but yeah, I guess it, it should be fair game. But yeah, a lot of great Ryan Miller moments, unfortunately. For some reason, a lot of them aren't always the best situation for him, though. So, Well, then, yeah, because he gets hit by Lucic and he comes back from concussion-like symptoms, and Jordan Tutu runs him. So that's just yeah. that, that's the, the story with that. But obviously, a great career for Ryan Miller, one of the best American goaltenders ever, if not the best, good for him, and hopefully happy retirements for Mr. Miller wherever he goes. He may be a guy that probably I'm, – I'm sure he'll get a front office job somewhere. He seems like one of those guys that will just find a spot somewhere. Yeah, he, he does, and I think he probably knows that, and it's something to consider when you retire. Like he, like I say, he's, he's 40 years old. Like eventually, you get to an age where I think you, you just want to settle down, even if you love hockey, because you got to love hockey playing to that age. So so he'll, he'll definitely be in a uh, position with some organization, maybe Buffalo again. Well, <laughs> they, need some, <laughs> they need some hockey guys in there that yeah. know a thing or two, because Despite Kevin Adams playing hockey and playing the NHL, winning the Stanley Cup with Carolina, hey, that's uh, <laughs> yeah, not not the not the best going over there in Buffalo, no. and Pajulas and whatnot. Shout out to my buddy Jordan DeShane. but um, a couple of other things to mention here. Jake Vertanen, we mentioned it a little bit. He has been asked to leave by the Vancouver Canucks amid some allegations. There's an investigation going on. We don't know much more than that. Obviously, more details will come out in in the near future, but obviously hopefully everything is kind of all settled down over there. Obviously another big one in Montreal, Jonathan Drouin, despite Montreal starting to make a little bit of a push and kind of showing that they're a playoff contender. He is being granted personal leave from the Montreal Canadians. And this is, and I, I was listening to 31 thoughts the other day with Merrick and Friedman, good buddy Frege. It's something that, especially this year, Tate, or not this year, but that past couple of years, Mental health is such an important thing, and we're all really hoping that everything is okay and that Drew then is able to get healthy with this leave. Yeah, I mean, none of us can understand the pressure of, first of all, playing for Montreal, but as a French-Canadian player, um, I think he has three goals this year, um, obviously struggling and, and fans getting on on him. I remember at the start of the year, they were really like, because he had a ridiculous amount of assists, so they really thought he was showing himself this year, but it's just... Like, pro athletes put – like, we expect a lot from them, but they expect a lot from themselves. And, and it's something that, again, we, we just would not understand. And it's important to take care of and, and to make sure that, that you're doing okay and you're okay with yourself so that – because I really think he still has something. You see the flashes, obviously, going third overall. And, again, he I hope he comes back strong, and, and it'll be interesting if he comes back in the playoffs. He, he's such a dynamic player, and I, I remember watching him in Halifax and even the early years with Tampa. It's like, all right, this kid's got something. And when the trade happened for Sergachev to Montreal, I'm like, all right, he's going to be the next piece, and it just it may, it may just be the pressure. And, you know, it's – I remember, when, of course, we had the NFL draft this past weekend. I was talking with people, and I'm like, you know, is Trevor Lawrence going to actually save the Jacksonville Jaguars? Well, maybe not, but he's going to be a little bit more comfortable than playing in the New York market, where he could have played for the Jets. So that's kind of like what I think about is where Tampa, Tampa, I'm not saying Tampa's not a hockey market. That's not what I'm about to say. I'm saying is it's easier to be a hockey player in Tampa than it is to be a French Canadian player in your province of Quebec in Montreal. It's a little bit easier on the guy. 
Yeah, like I always think you take Austin Matthews, Leafs took him first overall. What if this guy came into the league and had a season like Jack Hughes to start? Like it, the fans, they would be ruthless. Like it just, it they would be protest. inappropriate. Yeah, they would protest. Like, and then then that's always going to be on you, and you want to be so good. And I think we've all we've all been in positions where we wanted to do so well at something that we overthink it or we're we're holding our stick too tight. It's just there's just too much pressure there. And then when you get in your own head, you're you're make you're just making mistakes at that point. It's a really tough thing to do, and a lot of and some people think, oh, it's they they're superstars, they're so talented, they should be good right away. Well. <laughs> There is a mental side of this game that I think some people just tend to overlook. And that's why I'm glad like this is why I kind of like on the show. I'm like, hey, these guys are human, too. Like, that's why when I mean, we're going to get to here at the U18s, like there are some players that are underperforming. And I'm like, well, you know, these are kids on national television who probably haven't seen this many NHL scouts in their life in one building. I mean, that's, there's pressure involved and some people are, some people step up, some people rise to the occasion. Some need to work on it and kind of are maybe feeling a little bit too much pressure and ends up affecting their game. Yeah. Cody and I have had this conversation because we do do a junior hockey podcast. And at times you're, you're criticizing teams and, and specifically players like uh, SDA got it a lot because again he wasn't scoring and and Craig Budden came out with a tweet saying uh, that if SDA got traded from the Peets they're not going to really miss his three goals and some people are like wow how can you say that about a a junior hockey player like because he kind of took a shot at a junior hockey player and and Budden responded like he has an NHL contract right so it's it's really difficult to know wh- what to say and how to say it i think the players know that most media aren't coming like we're not coming at you personally it's just we're doing a job we have things to say um we have to address the obvious a lot of times so i don't know it, it does put you in a, a tough predicament yeah it's and i I've done it before, and you know it's the crazy part is, unfortunately, I wasn't able to go to an OHL game this year. We'll get to that, um, <laughs> but my brother and I would go to USHL games in Muskegon over here, a little bit less than the OHL, but they're around the same age, 18, 19 year old kids. And when we were coming up through high school, it was fun to yell at the players, or whatever. Now we're, I'm 26. My brother just graduated today; he's 23, and we're like, or he's going to be turned 23 this year. We're kind of looking at each other. We're like, should we be yelling at these kids? Like, we're like men compared to these guys. Like, I feel we felt the last game we went to, we just razzed on, I think it was like the Lincoln Stars they were playing. And we just razzed on this kid who had like, he was like minus 30. Like, he, I'm like, oh man, where's that green jacket, kid? You're going to go play some golf. And oh man, oh man. I, we went, we left that game kind of feeling a little bit guilty for, for how we treated them. Yeah, I think you have to, like, I, with Cody and I, I think there was a point with SDA, like, we we took a step back and said, all right, we're being a little hard on him. Let's let's maybe loosen up a bit, allow him to, to be the player that he is, because some guys just they just don't shoot their pass first guys. And and then especially in the arenas, like you go to an OHL bar and someone's uncle is calling some seventeen year old, sixteen year old soft and you know, it's just it's just how those those people don't necessarily view them as, you know, sixteen, seventeen year old kids. Like to them, they're that's their favorite team. They want you to win. They want you to to have the same amount of passion or heart that they feel like they have uh, towards the game. So it's like I said, I, I try my best to be understanding when you when you hear that or see that. Uh, but at the same time, we we got to take a look at ourselves to let's see what we're saying. And that's one thing too, as we kind of flip the page over here to the U18s. One of the big prospects coming in, Bob McKenzie at TSN, had him ranked tied for second in his draft ranking. Simon Edvinson for Sweden. And I remember Bruce Levine of the Dallas Stars. Him and I have been calling a lot of the games together on Hockey TV, and we were talking about this: like, is Sweden bad, or is this kid not as good as we think he is? Because he's six foot five, over two hundred pounds. He's a men against boys. He's going to be taken probably in the first round. But we just look at him like, man, as his draft stock fell. And that's why it's so hard to, especially this year, because there's only like highlights or video you can watch of these yeah. players. There's not as much, you know, being able to go to the rinks, even for scouts overseas that go to the rinks and watch these kids play. 
And that's why it's so tough because imagine a kid like Simon Edmondson, who is 18 years old, still a kid, having to go up and all of a sudden see guys like Steve Eiserman in the stands and Doug Armstrong of the St. Louis Blues and scouts galore from everywhere. Like I have seen every NHL team, at least every NHL logo on someone's jacket in the rink there here in Plano. And it's, it's incredible because these guys, these kids probably, they probably play in front of scouts overseas, but they, they know they're there. But imagine having everyone, because here's the thing. It's not like when you're at a rink and, you know, Simon Emson plays in Sweden, European hockey fans, some of the best there is, better than some North American fans, I will say it. And I'm looking at Toronto as well when I say that as well. <laughs> the church sometimes, I swear. It's, yeah, I was on church in Carleton up at the Maple Leaf Gardens because it was quiet sometimes. But it's... It's incredible. So you imagine, you know, you score a goal and woo, the crowd's going nuts and there's reaction. And sometimes players feed off that. All of a sudden you're going to a rink where it's going to a game where literally it feels like a jury in a courtroom watching you and watching every little mistake you make. Some kids are not used to that. And that's why I don't look at Simon Edmondson as good as he is. And we've seen flashes of his talent. I don't take this tournament as, all right, he's a bad player because he can't play in front of pressure. It's probably the first time he's done that this season, play with a little bit of some eyes on him that he wasn't ready for. Yeah, and, and when you go to an arena and any time you watch a junior hockey game or whatever, the scouts are usually kind of hidden. Like, you, you don't always know where they're at, so I do think it's easier for, for players, you know, to play their game, especially, I, I'm sure coaches, I've, I've seen uh, Trevor Latowski have this debate where sometimes they'll tell a player if he feels like he's having a bad game, like, hey, there's this scout's here. Like, I talked to him in the beginning of the game, and the player will turn it up. Or sometimes he just won't tell them so it doesn't get into their, their head. So, And scouts do kind of already overrate these um, international tournaments. We see it with the World Juniors and stuff. So imagine knowing that so few scouts have seen you in person this year. So you're, you're probably putting even, again, we're talking about pressure. That's kind of the theme so far. So much pressure on this one tournament on yourself and, and again it can just get in your head like I think I think Othman in that first game who's not very big at all you know got Edmondson pretty good in that game and that clip's being shared all over Twitter and everyone's talking about it so it's again we're they're just probably he's probably just in his head a little bit because he's just not used to this yeah and I, I'll admit I've seen quite a few big guys in this tournament Leon Bixell for Switzerland who is 16 years old is 6'4 210 <laughs> He's been rocked a couple times. I mean, I, I mean, we've seen Chara get knocked down. Big guys can get hit. Now, yeah. yes, Brendan Othman is a little bit smaller, and I haven't even seen Connor Bedard throw a couple of hits or two. I mean, that's just how the game is sometimes. And you know, going back to the point of pressure, Connor Bedard, everyone, some people are kind of like, oh man, you can see that he's got talent. He's able to move the puck around, but you know, where's this 15 year old sensation we we he keep hearing about in the WHL? Where's all the scoring? He's only got one goal. How? Listen, this is his first ever international tournament ever he never he didn't even know this tournament existed before he was <laughs> before Can hockey canada came calling he told that to ken campbell the hockey news Stephen ellis gave us that story last week on the show here and you know what he looks fine i watch his play and i'm like you can tell what he's trying to do and sometimes he's trying a little too much but this is his first time and like i said even though when he plays in the whl he'll see some scouts but he's never seen this many pe scouts that had nhl logos on their sweaters. He's usually seen only junior scouts playing up through the CSS, CSSHL over there. Well, he's 15. He's a point per game, which is which is already ridiculous. Which is fine. And he fit, yeah, which is which is fine. And, you know, first of all, he's got an NHL-ready shot. So I understand people want him to, to score more goals and maybe they expect more, especially when he's probably had the, the best exceptional status season of all time. Obviously, it was a, a shortened season. But the one thing I want people to keep in mind, so this is the U18s. So Shane Wright, obviously, you know, he's played two games. He's got the five goals. He's he's already 17. I know a lot of people view him as a 16-year-old, but his birthday's in January. Yeah. Connor Bedard has not, like, only is he young, but he has a late birthday. Like, his birthday's not till July. So he's like a real 15-year-old kid. Uh, playing against 17, the best 17 year olds. So, again, maybe we should ease up on him, but it, it just, you find it funny because he's a point per game. Yeah. Like most players, like I said, he, it's the shot. So people expect the most, more goals, but it's, he's, he's fine, especially on this great team. He's not being afforded the ice time that, 
maybe the uh, the kid in Russia is getting. So, I mean, he's he's going to be okay. I think he'll be a decent player still. <laughs> yeah, he's been pretty much stuck to the second or third line on Dave Barr's team. The top line, while Wright was while Wright's in it, it's been Othman, Wright, and Gunther. Gunther's been quite playing with them a little bit. Um, but my thing is, like, and I remember I mentioned this off the top before game one for Canada. Canada has all these draft eligible prospects. They have, you know, McTavish and I mean, there's so many just top end players for this team. All the draft eligible prospects are not even the two best players on their team with Bedard. <laughs> and of course, you mentioned Shane Wright. Now, Shane Wright had an interesting tournament. Comes out against Sweden in a game that nobody expected to happen. Yeah. 12 to 1, Tate. Trust me when I say when we were calling that game, Skip and I, we're seriously, I'm sitting there like, this isn't right. This isn't supposed to be happening right now. This should like we're Sweden's attack. Where's I mean they played fine against Belarus. Where's where's the fight? And the, Canada just kept coming. And Shane Wright, what was the final score? Didn't OHL have like nine of the ten goals? I mean Shane Wright yeah, of course we, had three. Yeah, yeah. OHL players I believe had had nine goals. And the crazy thing is, I think Shane Wright's last game, which was over a year ago, uh, last competitive game because I'm sure he's played some type of hockey. Uh, was a was a hat trick in the OHL so, against Flint. So, yep. <laughs> so he comes in, he gets a hat trick, which is just it's just crazy. And all those OHL guys, I mean, they haven't played in in so long. I mean, some of them have obviously played overseas, but it's still still impressive. And and this kid, like even to get the C, like he's he's still a young player, not draft eligible, and he really. I I, I don't like Cody and I were trying to think of a comparable for him, saying like a. Pr- like Bergeron that can put up more points maybe like it's it's hard to describe him and he looks big now yeah so he, he, yeah. He's, he's been impressive he's 183 pounds at a 16 year old age like that's impressive and the hard part is and I've I've succumbed to it a little bit myself is making those comparisons to NHL players I try my best not to because but unfortunately just for the general public they like what's this kid like I can say that Shane Wright dynamic skater very creative can play in his own zone. Okay, but who is he like? Well, he's 16. He could change by the time he's 19. Like Austin Matthews came in, and I could say he had a – I mean, I'll, I'll say this. Austin Matthews, when he came into the league, was slow but could shoot the puck. Now all of a sudden, he can skate a little bit faster, he can still shoot the puck like crazy, and he's a better defensive player. Now I'm not saying I'm going to put him up for Selkie, but my point is the fact that Players will change. So when you see these guys saying, oh, he's just like Connor Bedard. I mean, he's just like a, a nifty little scare. He's like Denny Savard out there or something like that. I'm like, yeah, yeah, he's 15. Like he may, well, he may grow two more inches or three more inches. He's 15. His growth spurt's not done yet. Yeah. For all we know, he could shoot up and all of a sudden look like Wayne Simmons coming down the right wing side with maybe better <laughs> hands. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying. It's like, it's hard to make these compare. It's hard to not make the comparables. I try not to, but I, I've been in, I've been really impressed with Canada based on the fact that even when Shane Wright was out of the lineup, trust me, when we saw that on our roster sheets, we went, oh, and we went, I went over to Brian Mudrick of TSN. I'm like, Brian, what's up? And he's like, precautionary reasons. And we're all like, no, not cold. Because <laughs> every, that's, when you hear when you hear the words precautionary in today's yeah. world, you're thinking COVID right away. But Brian quickly followed up and said the Hockey Canada is stressing hard that this is not COVID related. And we're like, okay, upper body or lower body? And he's like, we got nothing. I'm like, all right, well, I mean, that's not even, that's more, that's most unlike, I mean, typically it's more rare to say there's nothing wrong than there is actually describing what's wrong. At least they'll say upper body, lower body, nothing. Yeah. Now, granted, he puts up two against Belarus last night, and I'm like, what's the problem here? <laughs> it's, was he actually and like it didn't seem like anything was wrong with him. So I guess maybe that's a good thing that it was precautionary if it like he had like a nagging knee or something possibly. Yeah, and I was thinking I'm like, you know what, maybe it's because of the amount of the amount of games that they're playing and he hasn't played in so long, maybe that's that's a reason. But at the same time I'm like, well, same with these other OHL guys, especially I mean Mason McTavish uh, it was kind of the one that stepped up in his absence. So but again, that's a player that played in Europe, so maybe that's the difference. So I don't know. I, I'm sure, like, Hockey Can is looking at Shane Wright and Connor Bedard right now as, like, these are our guys. This is Hockey Can's guys for the next, you know, 
20 years or, or whatever we gotta we gotta take care of these kids in the best way possible so whatever the reason was if they felt it was the best reason and and obviously team canada was still fine because they went four and oh and, and the uh prelims there so if if the decision if they felt like the decision was okay obviously then then they were fine yeah that that's one thing i think some people are have to remember is that these players are still kids and they have a long hopefully a long future ahead of them you don't want to push them just because and there was um well i think one of the guys that's probably had one of the toughest tournaments is olin zellweger i mean he's been a guy that's been banged up banged around um was kind of a big part of everett last year in rookie scoring but this year he's come out pretty strong he had a goal and an assist i think he's at seven points right now he took a couple of big licks in the last couple of games for team canada i'm like man, you really want to keep him going, but he kept coming out and kept helping the team <laughs> score. So I guess why not? Well, you know, maybe the, the depth on defense isn't there as much as it is on offense. So so that might be a reason why they, they kept him in. And obviously, like, he's having a hell of a tournament as well. So so it doesn't hurt him. And again, these these guys haven't had a lot of opportunity. Uh, I believe he's he's draft eligible for this year, right? 20? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So, so obviously um like he did get his he played 11 games this year um so he's played some games but obviously you just want to be seen as much as possible uh just just to raise that draft stock so i i remember there was one shift i think it was the second game against latvia bedard went off and he was being looked at by the training staff and he's walking around and i remember i said to myself you got to be kidding me. First, right out of line precautionary. O'Connor Bedard is limping on the Canadian bench. <laughs> and I'm pretty yeah. sure. I'm pretty sure TSN was like locked in. We were actually using their cameras for the for whenever Canada played TSN's cameras, and that camera was locked in on number seventeen because we're like, <laughs> oh boy, the future of Canada is hobbling at fifteen. All of a sudden, I'm like, Bobby, or flashbacks now. <laughs> well, even even from a TSN perspective. It's it's a little hard to advertise a game without Shane Wright and Connor Bernard because these guys are must watch TV and it's not like there's nothing against a Mason McTavish or a Brendan Othman. Like these guys are gonna be uh potential stars in their own right, but Bedard and Shane Wright are, are franchise players. Like they're gonna be advertised and marketed throughout their whole career, so so I could see why TSM maybe was a little stressed about that. Well, no question about it. They're going to probably be both on the World Junior Team in Edmonton next year. One guy we have not mentioned yet, and probably another guy that will be on the World Junior Team next year, and that is the defenseman that you said was going to be the first OHL guy picked in this coming draft, Brant Clark, who is having a masterful tournament. I'm pretty sure I say his name at least 50 times a period, and that's just because of how dynamic he is. I believe he's right now at six points through the first through the pool play action, and when Wright went down and it seemed like maybe Canada was going to have issues against Latvia, he just seemed like he was comfortable and played pretty calm throughout the games. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing that you need from defensemen. I like, I just watched, when I was watching uh, Byfield's debut, um, he, they were playing Anaheim and you see Drysdale there and he just looks calm and, and comfortable and like he wasn't freaking out. And that's what's been impressive about uh, Brant Clark is how calm he's he's been this year. He also looks a little bigger. Um, a lot of people were talking about his defensive game because he can obviously put up points, but to me he's he's kind of look he's just looks solid back there. Like there's no other way to explain it. Um, he just does what you expect him to do. You know, you're just you're not even worried about him when you put a, put him out on the ice. I, I remember I was sitting there trying to think and once again I succumbed to the the overall pressure and the the status quo of comparing to him. And I was sitting there with Bruce, and I'm like, you know who he really reminds me of? And I'm thinking to myself, don't you dare say Tyson Berry, because <laughs> Tyson Berry is a solid defense. No, pardon me. He's not a solid defenseman. He's a solid guy that plays defense that scores. But I'm like, you know what? He's Clark, a great winger. He's a great winger. Just, you know, lines up on the blue line to start the game. I don't know why the heck he does that. <laughs> he ends up in the corner halftime anyways. But I I said, I'm like, you know, your mind just by the way he moves the puck at the line, and, he does, and he's, he's willing to jump in offensively but he's able to quickly get back. And I keep saying Brian Rafalski. That's the one I keep coming to my mind. And maybe it's because he is a right-handed shot defenseman. That's where I use that comparable for, but that's what I get from him. I don't see a guy that's panicking in the blue line. I don't think I've ever seen Rafalski, his blood pressure rise above 140. 
when he played at least. Then again, he had Scott Stevens to his left side, so if anyone came across the middle, he didn't have to worry about him anymore. Yeah. He'd be have to worry about the twenty minute wait for the stretcher to come out on the ice. But <laughs> but that's what I, I see with Clark though, is I see that kind of calm composure with the puck, calm composure in the defensive zone. He doesn't get caught out of position. He's willing to get in the offensive attack and that's what makes him such a dynamic player and such a high regarded prospect heading into the draft this year. Well, to be able to do that and, and still uh, produce offensively, it's just it's just impressive. Um, and he's done it in such a way, like when he came down on the wing there, uh, I forget what game it was, and he kind of just like he just sniped it. That might have been Sweet, Sweden. Sweden. Yeah, yeah. So that first game, um, it's just like that's just a s- simple play, just to take the ice to see that you have space. But to continue to go, because you do get some defensemen that once they hit that blue, they throw it in the corner and, and kind of move on. So, yeah, I've been impressed with his game. I, I've i seen some different rankings where where he's dropped a little bit. You know, Owen Power is kind of, you know, taking that, that, that top spot. But, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see where, where he actually goes. I would still think top five. But, again, I'm a little biased towards the, the OHL guys. Well, it helps that, I mean, uh, well, the, I will say this. It's crazy to look at the draft picks of the draft board this year because it's seemingly like any draft eligible player on the Michigan Wolverines is getting a lot of hype. <laughs> even, even though, and I'll say this, as a Michigan fan, they were not going to win the national championship this year. Even I know they got to pull out because of COVID issues, COVID protocol, but even with Ken Johnson, Matthew Beneers, and Owen Power, they were not going to win because they were going to have to play either. Well, they had they had to play Minnesota Duluth, or they've had to play North Dakota, and they were not going to beat. They were not going to beat both of those teams going through. So nothing against Wolverines, but they do have a lot of talent. <laughs> and you know, one guy that I mean, look, let's look at the goaltending here because Hockey Canada has put together over the last decade the goalie excellence program to make sure that they can breed goaltenders. Now, whether it's because we were spoiled after Carey Price and Steve Mason and whatnot. And I'm like, all right, all these gold medals of these young goaltenders coming into the NHL. We have great Canadian goaltenders. And then Canada ran into the bad years of having guys like, Mc- and I'm not saying Mackenzie Blackwood's a bad goaltender, but, you know, guys that were underperform, and of course, Scott Wedgwood and Mark Visentine, like guys that were good at the OHL or the junior level. They'd go to the world stage and they would kind of, you know, poop the bed. And all of a sudden, Mark Byzantine's hanging around in the ECHL because he's not good enough. And, and of course, well, there is the anomaly that is Zach Bucali, but that's neither here nor there. I saw him in Fort Wayne <laughs> two years ago. But I wonder, what do you I mean? What do you think about the goaltending this year? Thomas Millish, who's played a couple of games, looks good, plays for Seattle. Benny Goudreau played so well that Bauer sent him brand new pads. And he looked pretty good last night as well against Belarus. How do you think the gold tans look for Canada? Um, well, considering one has a nine seventy five and the other has a nine twenty five, I don't think anyone's complaining. Um, obviously, again, just because of bias, I, I would like to see uh, you know Benny get get some more games. Uh, I think he's a terrific goalie, and this is again another player that hasn't played in over a year to just to just be able to come in. And and play as as good as he has is is just so impressive in itself. And first of all, I, again, you being a goalie, do you do you wear the new pads right away? Is that so, I'm starting to notice they're starting to do that, goalies. That was a talking point with Bruce and I because we I saw the pads, I saw him post them on social media, and first thing I thought was Tim Thomas. I remember Tim Thomas dude that did that before the 2012 playoffs, that series against Washington when they got knocked out. He was wearing bonds for the last couple of years, and all of a sudden. Warrior, <laughs> just changing brands and everything. Now I'm not saying that Benny Goodrow changed from Bauer or to Bauer from something else, but game one against Latvia plays really well, gives up a couple goals, but had to bail out Canada wearing his Sarnia Sting pads. All of a sudden, Bauer's like, "This is a problem. Take your new stuff." Now, to this is where I say people are like, "Oh my gosh, that's bad. You got to wear new pads." Well, he, first of all, he didn't wear them that first game. He backed up Millish in the first game, so he still got some skate. He got to skate with them, but the technology nowadays for goal pads has changed so much over the last couple decades. Because, and I remember I met up when I was in Florida for a tournament a few years back when I was in college. 
I ran into, there was a CCM rep there and he had some equipment or whatever. And we were talking about goal pads, obviously, because I was thinking about going to CCM or Vaughn and I was, we were just talking about it. And he showed me the glove and like brand spanking new glove, not a puck mark on it. Just came, looked like it just came out of the factory and I'm squeezing this thing. No problem. And he shows me the blocker and it feels comfortable. And I'm like, what, I'm like, what's going on here? And he's like, this, these are brand new game ready pads, game ready equipment. Long are the days of having a goaltender that has to skate 15 times to wear in goal pads or wearing a glove. Now, granted, they still make those kind of pads because obviously when you're practicing them most every other day, eventually you want to let stuff that doesn't wear out quickly because the game ready stuff, albeit while it's ready, doesn't have the longevity as a basic set of equipment does. So Bauer probably sent Gaudreau probably brand new pads, yes, but a glove that was ready to be, you know, not pucks are not going to bounce off it or pads that they may be springy off the legs. So those rebounds are not going to be as soft as probably his Sarnia pads because he, <laughs> he faced a few shots last year, but I'll, I mean, but the thing is that they're, they're not going to be as stiff. They're not going to be as uncomfortable, a little bit of an adjustment. Cause for me, eyes, I mean, I'm, all of a sudden you're going from black and yellow to red pads. It maybe changes your vision a little bit, believe it or not. But in terms of being able to make a save and, play as you were with your old gear it's so much similar it's not as much of a change you have to the way you have to play goal as it used to be and that's why i think it's okay for goodrow nowadays to go all of a sudden from his sarnia steam gear to brand spanking new bauer vapors for with the canadian colors on it and still look comfortable i'd say he looked pretty good last night didn't did, i'm about to say did he even give up a goal i don't i, I was there at the I game think, uh... Yeah, two goals, uh, he gave, he gave, 26 right. shots. Yeah, yeah. but I, so uh, he, looked, he, he looked good, yeah. And and he is with Bowers. Like, I, I, I know he was sponsored before. Like he's came out with some pretty sick kits uh, with the Sarnia Sting and, and stuff like that. Obviously, this guy's got some swagger with the, the color pads. I know one of my buddies that's a the, – he's a goalie, too. He's saying that there's some voodoo with colored pads for some goalies. Like, it's something they just don't want to – do so they just go with the simple white with the uh accent colors but yeah this i i think this kid's sick i think i mean i think if he played this year like he broke records last year in sarnia like the first win sarnia guy i think he made over 60 saves or 61 something like that so it's like i, I think he would have been a first round goalie if he got to play this year and and i really do hope he gets an opportunity to show how good he can be in the rest of the way of this tournament yeah, and I th- I think it'll be tough to see goaltenders go in the first round. I say especially this year because we don't yeah. really know. There have been a couple of really good goaltenders. At least that impressed me, and it's kind of a bummer because I really thought last night going up against Belarus, I'm like, all right, cool. Sh- you know, uh, Shika Tikon Shika is going to get the night off. We're going to see Danny Jaga- or Ivan Jagalov, who played really well against the Swedes, and they start their 16 year old goaltender. And I literally looked at myself. I looked to the guy I was calling the game with, and I'm like. Well, this one's over. He's like, what, what do you mean? Hasn't even started. I'm, he's not the biggest hockey guy. He doesn't quite understand. I'm like, listen, you had a goaltender that played well against Sweden in game one, makes 39 saves. And all of a sudden you think, hey, you know what? Because Belarus going into that game had a chance to finish second. If they had simply won the game, you would have had a three-way tie between two teams that are three teams that are three and one, and they would have been over Sweden due to goal differential. Yeah. So you would have thought, maybe give it a shot. But unless you went into that game thinking you were going to lose, which I guess started in your 16-year-old goaltender who hadn't even seen the ice, maybe with a couple of shots and warm-ups, the exception, like all of a sudden that's what they do. And I'm like, okay, if you want to finish third, now and now here's the thing. Instead of taking on the Americans, whose goaltending has been shocking this tournament, they get to go up against the mighty powered offense in Russia tomorrow. <laughs> I'm just saying, not really real, not quite a getting a feel for the room, not reading the room of what could be, because I would much rather face the Americans right now than Russia. But then again, I only study the numbers and watch the tape, so I only don't, I only know so much about the two teams. <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you, that Russia team is like, I'm going, I'm, li- I'm ready to call that game tomorrow with Bruce, and I'm like, it's going to be a little lopsided. Well, it's the two games we have in Plano. You have Canada taking on checks, which. Czech Republic are interesting. That's going to be over at Comerica. U.S. taking on Sweden. That may be the best game of the quarterfinals because in over in my rink, we have Finland versus Switzerland, who a Switzerland team that can't stay out of the penalty box and has a penalty kill, ready for this, 50% in the tournament. Not a, not a, And I'm not talking one game. Not that ideal. is the tournament. 
it no. is, and they, and it's not like they, it's like, oh, they've only taken three penalty or four penalties. Only, they're no, flipping they, coins they, on the bench, I think. Oh, Lord. They are, they have taken, I think they've taken the most, or at least given up the most power plays this tournament. So Finland's got that just about in the bag, possibly, unless Swiss can stay out of the penalty box. They almost had, they had Sweden on the ropes had it not been for that five minute major against Sweden. But, and then you have Russia versus Belarus. And, I, I don't see anyone stopping the Russian offense right now, <laughs> at least not until they find, you know, they go up against a team that has a solid defense. And I mean, they were able to put, I mean, I think they scored the most goals this tournament. They put up seven against the Americans, six against Germany, only three against Finland. Finland's right now looking like the favorite going into the quarters. And then they put up 11 on the Czech Republic. <laughs> Let's start the 16 year old goaltender again, Belarus. Let's see what happens there. <laughs> Do you know the, uh, well, so that Russian kid, uh, Mikov, or yep. um, I hope I'm <laughs> saying his name right. I think it's uh, uh, Mishkov, man. Matvey Mishkov. Oh, Mishkov. Yep. Okay. So uh, I know the record like that Alex Ovechkin won. So the 14 goals, is that for the entire tournament, including these medal games? Or is I, that was that just for the, the prelims? Do you know? I, I think it's for the whole tournament. Because now, okay. granted, Ovechkin was that good where he could have scored 14 in four games. but Well, that's the thing. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Well, it's it's probably well. Hold on, let me. While we're pondering that, let's pull up the old elite prospects there on Alex Ovechkin. <laughs> it's I will say this: it's weird going on elite prospects for NHLers because even though the stats are correct and whatnot, it's still weird because typically you save that for like hockey reference. But, yeah. Because I only really go here for like all of the um, Alexander Ovechkin. Ironically, the first name you type in Alexander is the one that pops up. Because you only, I really only go on here for like, well, obviously a lot of my junior stuff and my high school stuff. Let's see, the U18s, he scored 14 goals in eight games, so it had to have been through the entire tournament. Yeah, so, the entire tournament. And if he's going so, up against Belarus, uh, I would not be shocked if he did it. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the thing. This he, this kid's got uh, four more game or three more games to score. Unless somehow Tikhon Mishkov somehow plays the game of his life. Uh, well, uh, Tikhan um, Tikhan Sheka, excuse me. If he plays the game of his life, boy, that'd be interesting. If Belarus pulls be. off the upset, that would be fun. Like just content purposes, and you know, you being a broadcaster just just makes good TV. Well, I will say this, and I looked up the Glass Cup. Belarus in the U18s always seems to be a little competitive. They finished second in their pool last in the last tournament in 2019. They're no slouches. Sure, they don't. They're not as dominant as Canada or Russia, but they seem to hang around. And they I mean, they they did get thumped six nothing in the quarters last time against Russia in the 2019 tournament. But they always seemed, and that's why they're in the top division, is because they just seem to find a way to get a couple wins, sneak up on a couple teams, and it's seeming like like they do what Switzerland typically does in the World Junior tournament. They win a couple games somehow by they upset one team and they beat the team they're supposed to, and all of a sudden, boom, they're a favorable team going to the quarters. Well, I think it kind of tells a story of what junior hockey really is, which is just a lack of consistency. It's just like, it's just these players, even the best teams in the OHL, sometimes you're just, they get beat by the worst teams. And it's just, you don't know how it happens. They can even out shoot a team by 30 shots and they still lose just because they're again, uh, in their own heads or whatever the reason is just when you're, 17 years old you just i don't know what it is you just you get in your own head well i and it's funny the time we had mike stubbs on the show here i remember i briefly mentioned during the interview the 2019 series against guelph and i remember i quickly moved on because i saw his face <laughs> i'm a knights fan you know that i'm a knights fan i'm like three and oh against guelph let's let's beat saginaw let's go smoke him i'll go up to saginaw and go cheer on I'm like let's go watch the knights go kicks the crap out of the spirit and they'll win the ohl championship and go on the memorial cup Somehow Nick Suzuki, it wasn't even Nick Suzuki was the best player for Guelph in that series. That's the craziest thing. Guelph just somehow did it by committee and they came back against the London Knights. OHL, junior hockey, like you said, is inconsistent. London kicked the crap out of Guelph those first three games. And all of a sudden, Guelph's like, you know, we can try too, you know. And all of a sudden, London <laughs> let off the gas and here comes, no pun intended, Guelph storming through the championship. Yeah. Yeah, it, and that's why it makes junior hockey so much like fun. And, and obviously, this translates over to the NHL, too. Like What separates the great players between the good players is just 
the the consistency or being able to do it game after game, right? Like, because so many players have one or two great games, but to be able to do it every night is just, I mean, that's that's a difference maker. It, it's such a it's a tough a tough thing to look at. And it's always it's fun to watch because you don't know what's going to happen. Shoot, there are some games where it's like, all right, we got the almighty, you know, London Knights or Windsor Spitfires going into Flint. Taking on the Firebirds and the Firebirds win six to one, and this is bef- <laughs> this is before the 2019-2020 season, not when Flint had the best home record in the OHL. Did yeah. they did they finish with the best? Home- they had one of the best home records last year. Yeah, I, I believe they did have the best home record. I, I think it was it twelve or thirteen straight at home or something like yeah. that. It was ridiculous. They were amount of wins. Yeah. Cl- it's cl- almost two years ago now, so Gosh. so it's getting it's getting crazy. Maybe they- not that aggressive, but. Well, they clearly were piping in the Flint water into the visiting locker. Let me tell you the what, because <laughs> the way that and I oh, and, it's, and I find I love Dominic Hennig and Dominic Hennig now with the Central Collegiate, the new CCHA now. But I, I remember I was looking at them like, that's not right. Flint's not towards the top of the division. How many games? <laughs> we're forty games into the season. No, this ain't. This has never happened. The last time the Flint franchise was good was back when, I'm trying to think of when Tyler Sagan was playing for Plymouth. That's how long ago it was. Yeah, it, it, it was a while. I mean, I think they were in the playoffs one other time. Um, but other than that, there was really, really nothing there. So, hey, they got sick team name. And I think, you know, Brennan Othman, he's uh, the biggest surprise of Brennan Othman to me. And this might be just a, a player you know, getting older, kind of finding himself is rookies tend to be, they just don't show the personality, obviously, as much. Uh, he he kind of has a bite to his game that I, I, I was unaware that was there. And he just, you know, he, he's getting in players' faces. You know he's out there chirping. I'm not, I don't know how much you can hear, but he just seems to be uh, get, trying to get the guys going. You can, it's, and that's the best part about our setup and how small the rink is. Like you, people talk about all the time in the NHL, you can hear F bombs or whatever and all that stuff. But in that kind of setting, cause it's open air, we're in the rink with them. We're not that far away. We're literally chatting it up with scouts in our front row. That's how close we are. And you can just hear, my goodness, the best one in this tournament so far is Oleg Sorokin's, uh, the Latvian head coach. Holy moly. Anytime Latvian was on the penalty kill, he was telling every player what to do, and you could hear it. And, of course, I didn't understand a lick of what he said because it's, yeah. it's foreign language, but you could tell he was, like, he was dang near Victor Tikhanov in front of the bench telling which player where to go, and I'm like, this is intense. Yeah. And, and it seemed like our camera guys just wanted to follow him because he was, whenever they looked over at him, his eyes were bug-eyed open and just yelling <laughs> whether at a player, a ref in general. Yeah. And then they'd go to a media timeout, and he would do this, Turn back to the pillar thing. You couldn't see his face at all because, like, he was like a pitcher and the like on the mound during a mound visit, trying to hide what he was saying. Because somehow they all of a sudden think we can read Latvian lips, even though yeah. Bruce or I cannot speak anything other than English and maybe a little profanity. But that's about it. <laughs> well, I think uh, I think coaches and even some players kind of I they think more people can read lips that actually can. I don't know how many people can read lips and you see them covering on the face off. Like who's zooming in on you in that moment to, to read what you're saying, especially hockey. It's not like set play. There's set plays, but there's not like it, it always gets broken up or it just, it doesn't go how you plan. So it's kind of, it's kind of weird that these guys look at that. Cages are hard to read through. If I get a close up on a player, like my, the, I think the most famous one I'm reading lips was Nazem Kadri and Ristolainen back in yeah. 2017 where Kadri scores a goal and <laughs> just drops right in his face. Hey, you. <laughs> That's still one of my favorite moments. I'm, yeah, that was a great oh, moment. Man. Dang it, Naz. Why'd you have to get the red miss and try to kill somebody? <laughs> Imagine yeah, if I you didn't. Naz. I, I miss Naz too. Colorado's loving them. I mean, obviously, they're having a great year. And boy, their goaltending will be an issue, but that's neither here nor there. Hey, Grubauer is, uh, I don't know, he, he, he's pretty consistent. He's consistent as long as he doesn't get hit. That's my thing is, like, if he gets hurt again. Oh, that, yeah, yeah that's that, yeah, then, then it's they, done. They don't have Michael Hutchinson there to save the day like he almost did last year. That's the thing that people forget. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, yeah, good job, Hutch. Good job, Hutch. Hey, Hutchie was doing fine, but for some reason we need Dave Riddick, who has been – we have, yeah, we, we have a goaltender that we did not need to. 
we, we only gave up, what was the Leafs gave up like a third or fourth round pick for him, so it's not like you're giving up a lot, but what, is something wrong with Hutchinson? Or, I mean, is was he really that bad when he was winning games? I think it's just Riddick has the, uh, I don't know, the, the potential to take over a game every once in a while where Hutchinson probably doesn't have that potential. I don't, I don't know, like, goalies, you guys, you guys are weird to me. I, I don't know what to say, because uh, sometimes, like, Big save day. Like anytime he came and played against the Leafs, he seemed to do really well. So it's just, I thought maybe he'd do the same for the Leafs, but I guess this no. is not the case. He plays like the Leafs goaltender that went against Dave Riddick. He's the one that gave up the speaker <laughs> while Dave Riddick on the other end was making 45 saves on the back of his neck or something like that. Yeah. But no. <laughs> so the rest of this tournament's coming up here. Is there any player that's caught your eye for Canada that needs to play better? I, and I say that, I'm trying to, and I, as I say that, I'm like, you know, no one's really let me down as of yet. There's not been any, like, Mason McTavish has fit the bill. Shane Wright, when he's in the lineup, has scored five goals. Connor Bedard has still looked good. It's like there's there's no one really out there that's telling me, hey, you know, you should be playing better because then again, Canada's just looked that solid through their first four games. Yeah, it's, it's tough. I guess, like, Brendan Othman... Maybe you want some more scoring from him, but again, like he does a lot of those little things that that are important to teams, right? So, so when he gets in a guy's face, he's chirping. Um, you know, he took the uh, again. I think it was a Swedish game where he took the hit to to make the pass to Shane Wright or whatever. Um, I get it, maybe you want a little more scoring from him. I guess like Connor Bedard, maybe you want some more from him, but. These are guys that you, you just you're not you're not upset. You just you wouldn't mind a few extra goals from them, and, and I'm sure they they think that themselves too. So uh, those are probably a, a couple guys that maybe you could get some more out of. Like the potential is there to get get some more out of, but um, I guess it's going to be up to them on on how how they can perform in these upcoming games. Because now we talk about pressure kind of throughout this entire thing and, and the pressure gets up here uh, moving into the, the rest of the tournament right and I was trying to quickly look up the schedule here we go so yeah Canada will be taking on the checks they get the three o'clock central four o'clock eastern time game tomorrow so they get the early game because god forbid the U.S. play not in prime time okay I was the same way for team Canada that, no, that was the best part because we were trying to figure out because we when we saw that Canada and the U.S. were in separate groups, we knew we were getting the Canadian group because they Americans were going to play in the big rink. Mm-hmm. And we actually met with the head of USC Hockey. He was all, just about at every game as much as he could because a lot of the games were at the same time. But he came over and Bruce and I were talking to him and it's like, what's going to happen for the quarterfinals? Obviously the U.S. because they already made it clear that no matter where the U.S. finish, they will play at Comerica Center. And he said, and like, yep, and the same thing will go for Canada. I'm like, does TSN not want to be in this little, nice, little, cute, little, punky-dory rink that we have over here? Do they want <laughs> now, I will yeah, say, yeah. Yeah, Canada's usually always in the the bigger arena, so I was surprised to see them in the uh, the smaller one, even though I know that's how the, the pool's played out. But, uh, yeah, it, it, it'll be fun for them to, to be in the bigger arena, though. Yeah, I think people will like it. And I want, I remember I was talking with Brian because I was shocked when I saw TSN had their setup, but I thought, okay, they'll have camera guys, whatever, but the talent will probably stay up in a studio up in Canada, right? Nope, Brian and Craig Button, they're all down here. And I'm like, well, this is this is pretty unique because I get, well, I mean, Brian and I think Craig both had, they, they, already got the, they already got shots already, apparently, from what I was told. And so they're going to have to like, go back and quarantine for like a week when they go back up there. So that's why they yeah. came down. Because I was like, oh, they're actually going to be down here, down here. And I was able to actually meet Brian, who we've had on the show before. Great guy to talk to. Um, well, it was one of my... I, I I had a couple of very interesting introductions. So I meet Brian Mudrick, which was no problem, because having talked to him before, he recognized me and whatever, and we chatted up. So then I get a chance to meet Craig Button. Craig, So Craig... We were in the hospitality room, and I'd seen Craig in passing. He was there. He was there even on Monday, even when Canada wasn't playing, because obviously Craig, the prospects guy there for TSN. I see him like I see him come in the hospitality room on Tuesday, and I'm like, you know, here's a good or Tuesday or Wednesday. I'm like, oh, here's a good chance to introduce myself, because you know what? 
meet another guy. Maybe he'll remember another face. So uh, for some reason, I have this ability to talk to literally any person in the world. But when it comes to introducing myself, I am horrible. <laughs> I go up to Craig and for, I started talking first. I'm like, hey, Craig, you should have been here Monday, man. We had brisket, whatever. Like, oh, yeah, I was here Monday because they were selling. They have some really good food down here. They, they, gave, us yeah. the, they gave us the southern treatment down here. <laughs> talking potato salad, ribs, all this good stuff. We had brisket on Monday. I go up to Craig and I'm like, hey, Craig, you missed it. I was like, oh, no, I was here. Cool. And I'm like, hey. And I'm like, all right, now go ahead and introduce myself, give my name. And for some reason, I don't know what the heck happened, but all of a sudden my brain decides to play a trick on my mouth. I was like, hey, I'm Tyler Kuehl. I'm supposed to say, hey, I'm Tyler with Hockey TV. What came out of my mouth was, I, I can't make this up. <laughs> Hi, my name's Tyler Kuehl. I'm with COVID. Oh, man. And That's all this, awful. That's and here, awful. The worst part is, is that there's there's two other guys behind him and the person serving it. Everyone went silent. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, I meant to say hockey TV. Nice to meet you, Craig. And I remember I am out of here. See you later, Craig. <laughs> him and I have been in, we've said each other high in passing. So it's obviously he's not completely weirded out by the fact that I don't know what the hell I'm saying half the time. I don't know if it beats my Steve Eiserman meeting, though, because I actually got to meet Steve. And it was in a very awkward manner once again. <laughs> this was during the Canada-Sweden game. And, of course, and uh, Chris Draper was here as well with the Red Wings because, of course, Eiserman, whether or not he likes to look at the Canadian players, he was also here for, I think, it's about every Sweden game, too, because, obviously, Eiserman, he likes the Swedes, not just because yeah. he drafted Lucas Ram, but that's just how Red Wings have drafted for a long time. So I – and I – but I noticed him earlier, but I, I walked up and we're going to the bathroom and I'm not paying attention. This is like between periods of Canada, Sweden. And the line was like massively long coming out of the guy's room. And I walk over like some dumb, hot headed idiot. Oh boy, this is the longest line ever. It's almost like the girl's bathroom. And I kind of said it to the guy in the, towards like the closest to me in line. And I'm like, and, but of course everyone's still masked up, but I'm like, you know, and all of a sudden, I kind of sat there, wasn't really paying attention to who was in line, but I look, and look at him again from like the side. He's got his head turned to me. He kind of looks like Steve Eiserman. And all of a sudden, he come, he came out of the bathroom eventually, and I saw the Red Wings door. I'm like, oh, dear God, that was Steve Eiserman. I just said that to Steve Eiserman. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> the told, legend. The legend himself. And my first <laughs> words to him are not, hi, Steve, nice to meet you. Great what you're doing there, Detroit. It's, good Lord, this line is long to this bathroom. <laughs> See you, everybody. Have a good one. Holy cow. I'm like, I almost, ran, I almost like that was, I went back to the booth and a couple of the guys over hockey TV were there. And I'm like, so I just met Steve Eisman. He's like, oh, how'd it go? The worst you could have imagined. <laughs> well, I'm sure he walked away. He called. He said, I don't know who the color guy for hockey TV is, but we need him in Detroit. I'm sure <laughs> that's exactly what happened right after I, that. So. I am not taking Ken Callis' job anytime soon. <laughs> and even Mickey, Mickey Redden will be there for another 40 years. He'll somehow make it work. No, the, <laughs> well, the crazy part is my wife, love her to death. For some reason, when I'm working, she thinks I can just go up to people and get their autographs. She thought the same way when I met Joe Thorne and Eric Carlson a couple yeah. years back at the GLI. And so she's like, why didn't you get a picture of Steve Eiserman? We were in the bathroom. <laughs> we could have given him a business card. We were in the bathroom. Yeah. And she's like, like, well, you could have said hi to him or talk to him up. And I'm like, listen, Stevie Eiserman, as great of a man as he is and legend as he is, he is not the most outgoing person. Yeah. He, he's not as, you know, he'll, like, he'll talk to you and he'll be very polite, but he's not going to be like, you know, hey, Tate, how's it going on the side of the road? He's like, he'll probably be like, hi, Tate, nice to see you and just keep walking. That's, that's kind of his, you know, how he is, his, his personality. And I'm like, I don't know how I can break that because he's the captain. And it's, it's <laughs> like, have you ever had like a weird introduction to someone like that or a weird encounter? Um, not, not necessarily. I mean, obviously in, in the media room, you, you see different guys. Like my thing is I, I never want to be that guy. You know, I, I remember, uh, I think it was, uh, it was uh, Mark Hunter was this while he was working with the uh, Toronto Maple Leafs um, was at one of the Spitfire games. And I was there with a, I was in college at the time. So I was there with another student and the other student took a picture of 
of Mark Hunter sitting there. And I, I just remember telling the guy, like, hey, let's let's not do that. Like, I don't know. It, it, so you have those moments, and you do have great, great stories. And uh, I do have a great story. Chris Pronger coming into the, the media room one time, the uh, PR guy at the time, runs up. He goes, like, he yells, like, this is across the room. Uh, he goes, hey, Prongs, you got to wear the wristband. And <laughs> Pronger just goes... F you <laughs> just across the room. <laughs> and I'm just like, that, that is awesome. I think he was working for the Panthers at the time. Uh, and oh. I'm just like, that was the cool. Cause he's Chris Pronger. Everyone knows who he is. It's just, he doesn't have to wear. Cause I think at the time, uh, scouts or like NHL people had to wear this like, uh, blue wristband or something coming into the WSCU center. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, not too many stories. I met Kyle do this <laughs> once just nervously gave the uh, the old like head down with the wave and yeah and he gave me one back but other than that nothing nothing too crazy it, it's weird because like i've been in the press room before and i've been able to ask questions to you know coaches whatever and however for some reason one-on-one i i i can i can public speak i can broadcast games i can do this show i can write whatever all this stuff as soon as i have to meet someone one-on-one personally just shattered <laughs> like confidence gone. I'm like, how am I supposed to say hi to this guy? And especially, and so it's, it's a weird thing, but no, if I, if I ever saw Chris Pronger and I heard someone say, you got to put a wristband on, I'd probably say, listen, you want this guy to be mad at you. That's a decision you don't want to make friend. <laughs> it was just like, and just, he said in such a way in the, uh, the, the PR guy, Chan is just like, gave like the head. Okay. And he walked away with the rich man. <laughs> hey, you just nope. like, no, you know what? You know what? Prongs, prongs is right. And the best thing is sometimes too, when they use the nickname and stuff like that, cause oh. I, you don't know what level they, they actually are on. And some guys just like, like, that'd be like when you're in the, the bathroom line and be like, hey, Stevie, it's just, it's, it comes off weird when you, when you do things like that too. So I hey, just try to avoid yeah. situations like that. Hey, Drapes, nice to see you, bud. Hey, do you ever go to this bar down, you have gone to Whataburger yet down here yet? Good Lord, <laughs> best burger ever. Who the hell are you? <laughs> yeah, they just, they don't even know. But again, I mean, some of these guys probably, they probably get the nickname so often yeah. that they don't even, they don't even care or, or whatever so maybe it's not that big a deal it's just something i i can't do i i couldn't do it either well shoot my dad said I'm like well if you're gonna introduce yourself make sure you say mr reiserman and i'm like why would i do that i'm like hey i would do it if i met him and my dad's and i said i joked to my dad i'm like listen you and Stevie eiserman are about the same height you have the same kind of widow's receding hairline going and you guys are just about identical you don't need to say mr eiserman it's like you're damn right. I'm gonna say Mr. Eiserman. <laughs> I, I probably, I might, I might have dropped the the Mr. Eiserman if I if I met him. Well, it's it, that's why it's kind of interesting to do. I do the show when I like had Ken Cal. I'm like, I say I didn't say Mr. Cal because I there was one. I'm like, I think I when I emailed Joe Bowen my demo. I said I did say to Joe Mr. Bowen because I don't know if it's because I have high regards for him or just because he is my elder by a lot of years. <laughs> I just yeah, never say much, but uh, Bonesy is. I know it's funny. I don't have my socks with me right now, but I've wa- I've rocked my Bonesy socks about every game uh, this tournament because he for some reason when I wear because I got those major league socks, you know. Yeah, you've ever seen those? So I got yeah. those. I got a pair of Dougie Gilmore's, and I got Lanny McDonald on the way. But I always, whenever I call games, I wear Bonesy, and for some reason, he just brings me a little good luck. I don't sound like a total buffoon. And I think that was the day I think I wore Gilmore socks when I met Steve Eiserman. So that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you if you wear the Bowen socks and you drop a Holy Mackinac on the uh, broadcast, I think it's allowed. I've so. only I've only believe it or not done it twice. I've only dropped the Holy Mackinac <laughs> twice in my entire career because everyone's got to have their own signature thing. But there was a yeah. couple saves that I just had to. It was necessary. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes sometimes you just gotta drop it. You know, it's it's paying homage. It's not stealing. Yeah, it's when you, uh, it's when the it's when the when the guys do it every game. When I was doing softball this year, I think I stole like Gary Thorne's home run call and um, uh, Jerry Howarth's call that he used to do. And that ball is gone. <laughs> and just how? God, I miss Jerry Howarth. But that is uh, about to say, yeah, the sun is shining outside here in Texas, and uh, I think that's about it. Tate, you got it. Well, Tate, I actually, I should probably mention this. 
he uh, hosted a Spaces on Twitter the other day. That was an interesting thing that I jumped on because I didn't know what the heck it was and I didn't know what to expect out of it. And that's a pretty cool little form that Twitter's got going. Yeah, it's kind of like Clubhouse. You know, obviously, like, I don't even have an iPhone, so I could never do the, the Clubhouse thing. But uh, yeah, I just I, it popped up that I had this feature. I figured I tried it. And we had uh, you and OHL Insiders and uh, Jonathan Moran from the Windsor Spitfires. And my co-host uh, Cody, who didn't say a word, which uh, <laughs> I was trying love to love that. I, I was trying to go to him to saying something, but then you ended it. I'm like, ah, I probably should go anyway. So I was gonna go. Yeah, Cody. so I want to. I'll, I'll definitely do like one of those again. And you can't record it though, so that's that's like it'd be cool to do like a live, like because we Cody and I don't do our shows live, so it'd be cool to do something live like that, um, but record it so we could post it later as well. So, but. That I wish they had that feature, but yeah, I think it was pretty cool to have, and we had a decent decent amount of people uh, join and listen to us and and uh, and talk. So yeah, we'll, we'll do a space again for sure. I wonder if there's a way, because I sometimes obviously I'm recording literally into my laptop. If you could take your phone and hook it in, or like if you're able to like uh, do like a screen record of your phone while you're doing it, because I were you doing it off your phone too? Yeah, I was just doing it off my phone just because it, it just popped up, right? So right. I'm like, oh, so I don't even know if it's available on desktop. Uh, it'd be something cool to, to try. But, uh, yeah, if I do it again, I'm going to try the screen record and then just convert it over to, like, an MB3 or Wave or something yeah. like that. But, yeah, cool new feature by uh, by Twitter. So I think it was the first, like, ho- that was the first hockey space thing I, I seen, so. I will say this. It's interesting. Twitter is always seemingly behind the eight ball and everything and all that sort of stuff like that. Well, they were the hashtags, whatever. But like then they started doing like the Twitter, the fleets, the the stories. Yeah. They brought that like a good. What? Two years after Instagram started doing it. <laughs> Facebook started doing it. Yeah. And now they're like, hey, this is a, what's that clubhouse thing? OK, we got to do it for us because we're more than just iPhones. We need we're Android people. Let's do it. Well, I think. Twitter's a perfect spot for something like that. Yeah. Like just just because everything is so event based, uh, like when you talk about the draft and stuff. So you could do a spaces and still scroll through Twitter and, and listen to a couple people talking about the current event that's going on or say the Leafs, you know, blow a game seven in the Stanley Cup finals against the Boston Bruins. Don't you that can happen dare. this year. Don't you dare. <laughs> you imagine. Oh, you know, my drinking problem spaces? may go to a problem. <laughs> You can do a spaces after that. So, uh, I mean, I'm starting to sound like a uh, Twitter spokesperson, but yeah, I think it's a pretty cool feature. I I'll say that. Yeah, the last thing, yeah, if you if the Leafs somehow lose to Boston in Game Seven of the Stanley Cup Finals, you will I will jump on a space. <laughs> you will hear the clinking of bottles in the background because I will be. In, I had a problem with the last Game Seven against Boston. I woke up in the morning and had to clean up after the side of my bed because apparently, uh, apparently having screwdrivers after a two for a beer is a bad idea. Uh, for <laughs> for future reference for anyone out there, but if they lost to Boston in the Stanley Cup Finals, I first of all I would I would literally d- delete Twitter for like a week and a half because yeah. I wouldn't be able to I would not be able to hold it together. After the space, after the spaces, of course. After the, after, yeah, after the spaces. After the, the me crying into my phone, <laughs> then I'll delete it. But yeah. that that's a, it's a cool concept because I, it's a, it's like almost like doing a live podcast because there's ways to do those things, but in terms yeah. of having it for free and kind of like, hey, half hour here. Or like you see, like to see people put podcasts up of post game after games. Like I know Wing Wheel Podcast does that. The Curfew Boys yeah. from Montreal does that. They follow us on Instagram. And I'm like, imagine be like right after the game last night or, oh my gosh, could you imagine of spaces after Wayne Simmons fought Alex Edler? Yeah. <laughs> Holy yeah, Vancouver jumping. media would have, would have loved that. Oh, that, but that was the most out of all the, out of the, the undercard of headlines this week. That was the best one. Vancouver having to change their diapers after Wayne Simmons fought Alex Edler. Honestly, I, I, I couldn't believe like when I, that night, I'm like, yeah, obviously people are going to be upset or whatever. It is what it is. But to see it continue the next day, and first of all, I didn't even know Edler had won. Like, that's a guy you think has fought before. He's been in the league long enough. Everyone's fought. Crosby's fought. Like, McDavid's yeah, fought. Yeah, like, I, I am sure if you asked Wayne Simmons before that game if Edler's ever been in a fight, he'd be like, yeah, obviously. He, <laughs> totally. he probably would have thought that. Like, he's not looking at his, you know, hockeyfights.com or whatever it is. 
so yeah that was that was crazy yeah they needed a, a spaces uh for that because that was just that was just ridiculous i mean i and when i i knew as well so two things on that last thing before we let you go here kevin when kevin bx went on tim and friends and said it was okay and i'm like see he yeah. played with him for gosh sakes he was on his d pair he needs well, none okay of the player that. yeah none of the players cared even the travis Vancouver green players yeah, travis green after okay. said it what well, it is what it is because he's he's been suspended before like people have obviously asked this guy to fight before and he has said no he just this time he just happened to say yes so he probably realized he doesn't want to get ran around or have guys go after him but the other one that was yeah. great was and this is why it carried to the next day and jeff merrick made a really good point on hockey central on was it it would have been friday right because the game was thursday yeah yeah yep. so he went on and said listen that and this is how they wrapped up the segment with it he said it's a great topic for talk radio you have an opportunity to yell, you know, it's a dirt, you know, there's a dirty hit. There's a fight with a player that doesn't fight. It's a great way to talk about it. It could last till Saturday and it's literally until the game. And I'm like, dang, Jeff, of course, then again, Jeff, he's been in the game so long. He gets it. Yeah. yeah. Heck, that's why we're able to talk about it on Sunday, four days after the fact. Now, granted, this is a, you know, once a week show, but I digress. Yeah. Well, my favorite thing about, you know, sports radio and talk, talk radios is being able to take calls. So, uh, I guess the spaces and, and those kind of things to have the opportunity to have listeners be a part of it is, is my next goal. Cody and I want to do that so badly. And, and we're hoping to do that this OHL season with, with a, like uh, we were going to open a whole entire zoom meeting and just like new people on and off to kind of take calls. Uh, yeah. So that, that would, cool. that would be cool. That'd be interesting. I've thought about that as well. We need to get a few more people to view before I start promoting phone calls. Cause <laughs> people to watch it first, but. Well, that's that's what Cody said. Uh, he's like, what, "What if we only have three people?" And I'm just like, "Then that's three people. That, it is what it is." I'll be honest. When I jumped on that Twitter Spaces thing, I thought I expected to be you, me, Cody. And that was it. I was like, I thought we were going to start talking together, but all of a sudden, I'm like, "Wow, there's a few people here. This may be yeah. interesting." Because then, yeah, then hell, if anything, because everyone's got their phones. As long as you're not like recording right off your phone, you could do your spaces while you're doing your show, right? Yeah. And you yeah, know, there's a sure. way to do that. So it'd be interesting. So, but obviously all that great stuff, all the Twitter and technology is with us. This is the Twitter technology show with Tate and Tyler here on the Kula show. We've been joined here by Tate Harris, one of the co-hosts of the O show podcast. They're putting great stuff out every week. It's been a tough year because, well, there is no OHL hockey, but next season, or especially in the summer, when we get to the draft, they'll be posting great stuff as well. Tate, enjoy the rest of the tournament. Have some fun. Watch some great hockey. Let's see what Canada does. They are favored going in to the quarterfinals. But as we've learned, junior hockey, it's a, who knows what's going to happen. It's a bit of a mess, and I'm excited to see the mess. Tate, you can follow him at TateHarris9 on Twitter. Follow the OO show at Podcast OHL, both on Twitter and Instagram. You can follow us here on the Cule Show at TK or hashtag TKS at the Cule Show, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. For Tate Harris, I'm Tyler Cule saying thank you very much for watching this another episode of the Cule Show on 12 Ounce Sports. We'll see you next time. Goodbye, everybody.